So a very good morning to all the participants, respective dignitaries, resource persons, ladies and gentlemen. I just got the information that the Honorable Vice Chancellor is on the way to join the training program. Till then, we will start with the briefing and introduction of the program. So my name is Ali Heather. I am working with the National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. And uh, I am one of the coordinator of this program. So to begin with the program, I would just like to introduce the program. We are having this three days online training program on, on the cultural heritage disaster risk reduction in collaboration with the Lok Jagruti Kendra University, Ahmedabad. This program is mainly aimed to, is mainly aimed to, for this, in, to train the participants and to know, to give them the knowledge on various aspects of disaster risk management of cultural heritage. The main objectives of this program are to create an awareness about the integrated risk assessment of the tangible and also the intangible or immovable and movable cultural heritage and their respective vulnerabilities. We are also aiming to demonstrate the disaster risk management of cultural heritage, reducing the risks, responding to disasters and recovering from them. The participant will be able to learn the practical tools, methodologies, and skills of, for disaster risk management of our cultural heritage. I thank the Honorable Executive Director of the National Institute of Disaster Management, Sri Taj Hassan, sir, the Senior IPS Officer, and the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the Lok Jagruti Kendra University, Sri Dinesh Avasti, sir. For, for gracing this program and allowing us to conduct this program in collaboration. I also would like to thank Professor Santosh Kumar, who is the head of governance and inclusive disaster risk reduction, disaster response and recovery divisions, National Institute of Disaster Management, and Dr. Anjana Vayas, the professor of Lok Jagruti Kendra University for directing this program and motivating us to have this program. On the outset, I would request Professor Anjana Vayas, Professor at LJKU, to please give a brief introduction of our dignitaries and welcome the Honorable Vice Chancellor. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abhijanja. Um, Good morning to all of you. Uh, we welcome you on behalf of Lok Jagrut Kendra University, Ahmedabad, uh, for this three day online training program. Um, I'm also welcoming the students who are uh, with us offline, sitting in the auditorium, and uh, is going to be blessed by the expert speaker during three days program. Uh, after welcoming, let me just introduce our Vice Chancellor of um, uh, LJ University, Professor Dinesh Avasti. He's a renowned economist by training. He's a Vice Chancellor of LJ University. He was a Professor of Strategic Management and Entrepreneurship at the Indian Institute of Management, Lucknow. Former Professor and Director of Entre Entrepreneurship Development Institute of India, better known as EDI in, at the national level in Ahmedabad from 2003 to 2015. He has over 60 years, 60 research papers, eight books, and 31 research reports on SMEs and technology entrepreneurship to his credit. Dr. Awasi has chaired and has been member of a number of committees set up by Government of India, Government of Gujarat, and several non-profit organizations. Professor Avasti has also worked as a consultant to several UN agencies like ILO, UNIDO, UNDP, and other multilateral bodies like DFID UK. He has extensively traveled across the globe in connection with the various professionals' assignments. I welcome Dr. Dinesh Avasti, Vice Chancellor, uh, for this inaugural function. Thank you, sir.
thank you ma'am for this brief introduction of uh, vice chancellor sir and uh, in, uh, and welcome him, welcoming him so now i request uh, the vice president of the lok jagruti kendra university dr manisha to please give a welcome address over to you sir um i'm sorry to the audience due to some unavoidable circumstances uh, mr vp is uh, not yet here so we'll continue with the program right now and uh, uh, welcome our uh, honorable vice chancellor to say some uh, words on the dais please sir yeah, thank you sanjeev uh, here sir the camera is here i'll i'll manage okay, okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Mr. Himanshu Thakur, uh, Director of uh, our uh, School of Architecture, School of Planning and Design. Mr. Anjana Vyas, Director of this program, Coordinator of this program. In absence, of course, uh, Mr. Taj Hassan, Mr. Santosh Kumar. and those who have not been able to come we would have been delighted if they were here uh, and seen how things operate i am extremely uh, delighted uh, to be here because this three day training program is being organized on such a important theme which cultural heritage disaster risk reduction i think heritage in general and cultural heritage in particular there is a great risk of disaster and these disasters are both the kinds one natural disaster on which we don't have much control and other is man made disaster where we have lot to contribute in a, to uh, reduce the risk literally this uh, natural disasters are like earthquake floods now the recently uh, thing which we talk about is climate change because of climate change also a lot of uh, sometimes very heavy rain sometimes long period of spells of very heat hot kind of uh, weather so this kind of things do impact the uh, historical monuments and heritage buildings quite a bit but more important is man made disaster which is happening these days which include arms conflicts uh, inefficient management imperfect construction like you start constructing roads and dams around those uh, heritage buildings which are at risk you have city development and most of the heritage things are around the cities be it china be it india or europe wherever you go these heritage buildings are by and large in the vicinity of those cities and because of the expansion of population and expansion of infrastructure the worst impact which is being suffered is by heritage properties and added to this in order to make places popular we have unmindful uh, tourism development wherever there is a heritage building governments start promoting tourism and the footfall becomes so heavy that it becomes much beyond the tolerance and overbearance of any heritage building so these are some of the issues which i think uh, we need to address and the for which policies up at the un level or at the government level there are policies but those policies are hardly implemented a hardly taken care of i remember my visit to poro forest i think i will recommend all of you to if you are interested in heritage buildings go to poro forest and there are a number of jain temples which are about 500 years or 600 years old <coughs> lot of jain temples antar subha and those temples are so beautiful yes sir what and they they remind you at the time uh, as if uh, you are in uh, siam river india yahan sir 
ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम ऑन रिस्क रिडक्शन of heritage buildings cultural particularly cultural buildings is very very important and is this young generation must know that there are something worth preserving you are preserving your heritage no not today but this belongs to the generations the 20 30 generations which we have <laughs> passed by and it is our responsibility to ensure that those things are not lost forever there are generations which have witnessed this loss there are civilizations which have which are no more because we never bothered to look at those things so but i will like to congratulate uh, uh, ndmi for uh, organizing this three day training program i was looking at the un list and they also conduct a large number of uh, training programs on these issues but the kind of initiative which uh, uh, national disaster management institute has uh, national, national institute of disaster management has taken is worth commending uh, i would also like to congratulate and compliment uh, professor anjana vyas who has taken the initiative uh, to bring this program uh, at lj so that we are more aware of what is happening so thank you very much and i wish this program great success and when we come for uh, valedictory or concluding session uh, i will have more uh, idea of how things have gone and how much you are aware of what is happening and what should not happen thank you very much thank you sir thanks a lot for gracing this occasion and praising with your kind words you have perfectly highlighted the few very important points which we will definitely be taking in all these three days how the natural hazards and the uncontrolled disasters are affecting our our monuments and the cultural heritage the effect of climate change on these monuments and how can we how why it is important to reduce the risk to conserve and preserve these heritages you also highlighted and mentioned about the human induced disasters which are maybe due to the urban development the un, i would say the unplanned urban development and uh, the population expansion and why it is important to sensitize our youth or young generation uh, who can understand this long generation heritage how they built it and why it is important to preserve it to know our history and uh, uh, to learn from it so thank you sir thanks a lot uh, we are very grateful to, for your kind presence thanks a lot now i would request uh, ms akanksha to please uh, invite and welcome our honorable uh, resource persons from uh, turkey and uh, italy and dr nuran zerin and uh, dr erika and please uh, move forward with the technical sessions over to you thank you so much ali sir thank you so much uh, before proceeding for the uh, technical session i would like to give the token of memento to our uh, dignitaries and i request the honorable director mr mr manchu thakkar to come on dais and give the mementos to our dignitaries uh, before the starting of the technical program thank you um good morning i am akanksha patel uh, assistant professor of architecture and planning uh, lg university uh, as you all know that we have gathered for this three days cultural program uh, on 
three days training program on cultural disaster risk reduction and uh, heritage as we know is a cultural legacy uh, which we receive from the past which we live in the present and which we pass on to the future generations and which also play an essential role in our society by linking the past present and the future generations a basis uh, for building a strong nation and national identity we'll be discussing over these issues the risk on uh, cultural heritage further on in during this technical session and uh, for that i'll be um uh give a, a small introduction of professor nuran siren uh, glersoy uh, who is also a uh, graduate as an architect from istanbul technical university she has received her master's degree and a doctorate in urban planning she has worked for the faculty of architecture iitu between 1977 and 2018 presently she is the department head of architecture faculty of architecture design at fmd ic university istanbul turkey her primary areas of interest are urban conservation urban planning and urban design she is currently a member of management board and secretary general of the international planning history society society and a member of europa nostra icomo the group and our world heritage or wh tourism group at the international level uh, nuran ma'am over to you for a technical session thank you before starting excuse me actually can you please if possible turn the camera towards the participants so we will be able to see them Shall I uh, share screen? Yes, ma'am. You can start. Yeah, thank you. But it is written host disabled participant screen sharing. I cannot do it. Okay, ma'am. I request the host, the LJ University, to please give the right to ma'am so she can share her screen. Hello, Dina. Sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. They are just providing the rights to share. Ma'am, you are not audible. You are on mute. Yes, I cannot share the screen. Sorry about that. Ma'am, please try now. Post disabled participant screen sharing is written. Is that anything I can do here? Yeah, I think, ma'am, it is on our side, and we have to give the rights. So, just a second, ma'am. It's a great pleasure for me to attend the cultural heritage disaster risk reduction program. three-day online training program and deliver a lecture about Istanbul. Um, Ma'am, I think you can try now to share the screen. We have given the rights. Please share your screen with Nurana. Can you see? Yep. Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Perfect. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, today I'll try uh, to tell about the earthquake mitigation plan for Istanbul 
that I involved in as a leader of urban planner. As you know, uh, urban seismic risk management could be considered broadly in two groups. Often, seismic properties of sets of individual buildings are investigated by uh, geophysical and engineering analysis and recommendations for retrofitting removal made according to technical and economic feasibility criteria. A second group of management efforts focuses on urban systems uh, vulnerab vulnerabilities due to natural hazards and undertakes scenario analysis. The propositions of this second approach are often in the form of technical measures to be conducted by urban authorities via processes of land use control and tools of urban planning. The earthquake mitigation plan, it's a master plan of Istanbul, has provided the opportunity for an alternative to the existing methods of urban seismic risk management. The approach considers hazards of natural and human origin in combination within a framework of risk sectors and proposes lines of action to involve all facting of the urban society. The main idea is to bring together and activate in every risk sector related components of public administration, business and industry, NGOs and local community representation in the long-term management of urban risk to draw mutual agreements of conduct and control and to run various sub project packages. In the plan, the earthquake mitigation plan for Istanbul, altogether 13 relatively exclusive risk sectors have been identified for the whole city of Istanbul. The nature of risks in each sector are exhibited, methods of avoiding, minimizing, and sharing of risks demonstrated, and the agent responsible and to be involved indicated. High risk districts are designated as areas for action planning, where comprehensive rehabilitation, transformation projects are recommended for immediate implementation. Before explaining the plan, I want to give very, very brief information and some uh, views from Istanbul. As probably most of you know that the land of Turkey stretching out between Asia and Europe has been called the crossroads of the history. Istanbul here located on the two continents and two sides of the Bosphorus. Oh, sorry. Istanbul has been associated with major political, religious, and artistic events for more than 8,000 years of its history. Uh, I don't know, I can 
Okay. Throughout its history, Istanbul was important administrative, commercial, and cultural center of different civilizations. Roman Empire, Byzantium, and it continued to be so under the Ottoman rule. Yes, this is the plan of Istanbul. You can see Black Sea, Marmara Sea, and the Bosphorus. It is the, uh, it's not the capital, uh, Ankara is the capital, but it is the uh, biggest city of Turkey. The population is almost uh, 17 million. How can I remove this? Um, you. you can see the old city of Istanbul, Golden Horn, and historic part of the city. Maybe some of you already visited Istanbul and may. Maybe you have Kadıköy, I, uh, Golden Horn, and the bridge. We have three bridges on the Bos Bosphorus and historical peninsula. Istanbul, as I told you, very old and historic city. We have uh, important monumental buildings and also uh, natural and historic conservation areas. This is the historic part, Süleymaniye and Beyazıt. If I stop share and We share maybe uh, Mom, please restart your screen and it will be gone. Uh, restart your presentation. Is it okay now? Yes, yes perfectly okay. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, Aya Sofia is very important historic building of one of the historic buildings of Istanbul and land walls of Constantinopolis, Marmara sea walls, and in Anatolian site, Anadolu Hisarı. And we also have typical wooden houses in historic parts of Istanbul. Combination of several factors, its geographical situation, cultural and natural assets, increasing economic linkages with the Balkan region, Europe and Asia, construction and infrastructure investments, Istanbul is transforming in a multitude levels from local to global and consequently adopting a new model of urbanism. Yes, we have some new and old buildings together in the same view. And unfortunately, we have some skyscrapers affect the silhouette of Istanbul. But the important threat 
for the future of Istanbul is the expected earthquake in the next 30 years after the 1999 earthquake, which was one of the most damaging earthquakes in Istanbul. Now, I will start to summarize the earthquake uh, mitigation plan for Istanbul. In this plan, we worked together two universities, Istanbul Technical University and Middle East Technical University. Here you can see the names of planning group. Uh, most of them urban planners and architects. There are some professors and also some assistants. Earthquake, Istanbul earthquake uh, mitigation plan, as I told you, it's a sort of master plan assigned by the Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality to four universities by tendering procedures. It aims to develop a roadmap to be followed by the Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality and all bodies and individuals involved in the city, as well as the central authorities. Earthquake mitigation plan is a comprehensive coordination of mitigation measures to be implemented in the face of the impending earthquake in Istanbul, developing a spatial approach to the problem. It's an integrated plan to synchronize all physical, financial, legal, organizational measures with the aim of developing risk management methods according to the casual structures and spatial distributions of hazards and risks. When we start the plan, everybody thought that it's an urban plan, but it's not an operation confined. It's not an operation confined to the retrofitting, retrofitting of some buildings in the metropolitan area. It's not a conventional development plan describing simply some future physical state, employing the devices of physical rearrangement. It's not an exercise in strict confines of existing legal and administrative constraints. It's not a one-shot -shot undertaking. It's not an excuse to allow further expansion of the city with new waves of pillage over the forest and water basin. It's rather an urban environment is considered in its totality with its lifeline, emergency facilities, land uses, and management processes to generate tools to monitor organizational tendencies and processes. It's rather proposals are made for the development of new methods and tools of enforcement and the revision of existing legal framework. It's a sustainable mechanism and institution for a safer and more robust city and resilient communities are introduced. It's a comprehensive methodology for upgrading the existing built up areas in safety and quality and protecting the natural and also cultural assets. The overall purpose of 
earthquake mitigation plan is to enhance safety and quality of life in the city by reducing infrastructural deficiencies, gradually eliminating the unauthorized stock, integration of city management processes, protection of the natural and historical assets, reclaiming urban quality and identity, participation of the local communities in the management of the city, comprehensive rehabilitation of high risk areas, retrofitting or removal of buildings according to the local revision plans. Earthquake master plan is investigated in terms of three components. We call three components, contingency plan, action plan, and support and research activity. The plan, urban planning part of the plan consists of three components. Contingency plan, the overall plan to coordinate all documents related to risk sector, to identify risk management measures, the actors, supervision methods, and the protocols to be drawn between related and responsible bodies, specifying their obligation and lines of action. And the second uh, component is called action plan, methods of immediate intervention in rehabilitation areas to coordinate property owners and inhabitants to allow public and private partnerships with spatial public powers to synchronize resources and physical development. And the third part I will explain later, support and research activity. The contingency plan refers to analysis and risk management activities for the total metropolitan area. The overall plan to coordinate all documents related to risk sectors, to identify risk management measures, the actors, supervision methods, and the protocols to, to be drawn between responsible bodies specifying their lines of action. Here you can see uh, contingency plan risk sectors, macro form risk, urban pattern risk. I will uh, try to explain of each sector later. Uh, uses risk in lifelines, special risk areas, risk in building stock, hazardous uses, emergency facilities, special risk areas, and other risk sectors. Action plan related to ground conditions, building surveys, social surveys, local participants, implementation projects, physical transformation, retrofitting, removal, investment programs, and as I told you, support and research activities include promotion campaigns, uh, public relations, raising uh, resources, legal provisions, administrative coordination, preparation of protocols, data engineering, and other researches. Action plan refers 
to local comprehensive rehabilitation projects that cover physical transformation and community regeneration programs. Methods of immediate intervention in rehabilitation areas to coordinate property owners and inhabitants to allow public and private partnerships with special public powers to synchronize resources and physical development. Some of the support and research activities have been accomplished during the earthquake mitigation plan for Istanbul preparation stage. Others will have to take place at the implementation stage. Coming to the risk sectors, Risk sectors are relatively exclusive set of casual relations focused on specific urban risks or uh, vulnerabilities. Risk is the production of natural, technological, and man-made hazards and their consequences to people, property including services, lifelines, critical facilities, buildings, and environment. An effective response for a disaster requires to determine the risk, vulnerability, and potential based on situational assessment. Here are the uh, macroform risks that we analyze during the preparation of the mitigation plan. First, we started with macroform risk, risk in urban texture or urban pattern, risks related to incompatible uses, risks of productivity loss, risks in spatial area, open space scarcity risk, risks related to hazardous materials. We also uh, carried out uh, and put special emphasis on historical and cultural heritage. We tried to define the vulnerabilities of historical and cultural heritage. This is one of the sectors. Risks in lifelines, risks in building stock, risks related to emergency facilities, external risks, risks of incapacitated management. We collect uh, information about those uh, sectors uh, in the area and also collect uh, information from the related institutions. Uh, a contingency plan should include total risk sectors and relationship between these sectors, two steps to determine the risk sectors uh, in the plan. We try to determine the risk sectors in the city and determine the risk factors for each sector and to determine the method for database for each sector and to determine the parties, management types, sources, and timing of each sector. And also, we try to determine sectoral risk management. Uh, it's, uh, as you guess, very comprehensive study. Here, uh, I try to summarize the main headings of the uh, research, the titles are 
scope, problems, risk management, responsible bodies, and also proposal. Uh, I will start with the macro form uh, risks. Risks related to macro form involved in the structure of main access system and compatibility with urban settlement area sizes, densities and configuration, natural boundaries to expansion, water basins, long-term development tendencies, the whole city, I'm talking about the whole city with the macro form, uh, attraction points and investments of metropolitan scale, all investigated in relation to micro zone. During the analysis, we try to define the problems, of course. The main problem is high density building in hazardous locations, unauthorized development, Unfortunately, in Istanbul, we have uh, almost 50% of unauthorized development. We can call it squatters. And developments in forest and water catchment zone and uncontrollable urban growth uh, are the main problems of the macro form. Risk management, microzoning density reduction and uh, intensification areas, protection zones, designation of action planning zones and marginal areas for new urban development, tools for property exchange, transfer of development rights and differential property taxation, are used for the risk management and the uh, responsible bodies also defined uh, metropolitan municipality of Istanbul, district municipalities, ministry of public work and settlement uh, and state planning organization and of course governance proposals we also so during the uh, this stage uh, we try to make proposals uh, i'm trying to uh, put here only the titles a follow up committee formed by the representatives of responsible bodies universities professional chambers, NGOs, and evaluation symposium will be organized by this committee every year and recommended changes in the development law and the property taxation law. What are the reform risks? I also try to put the main headings Natural characteristics of Istanbul, as I showed you, I, as I tried to show you, post forest water basins with hazard areas determined seismologic and meteorologic data, sub districts of urban settlement, major land uses, uh, ports, industry, tax free zones, military airport, power units. Uh, has met storage and their risks based on scenario and also special emphasis put on the conservation areas, natural and cultural conservation areas, basic transportation and infrastructure lines, land ownership, the projects which has impact for future developments in Istanbul metropolitan area, administrative boundaries, the suitable areas for development, 
proposal and scenarios to reduce the risk for the macro form includes the urban development tendency for the long term. There are some limitations, macro form limitations, of course. The main uh, limitations are natural limitations. Uh, Istanbul has been developed in the area surrounded by Bosphorus, Golden Horn, Marmara, and Black Sea, as I showed you at the beginning. Topography, the areas which have more than 30% uh, slope requires detailed geological and geotechnical analysis. Water basins are the natural areas which should be protected from all type of threats at the north part of Istanbul. Here you can see the map developed according to these uh, findings analysis. This is a uh, topography. Uh, as I told you, forest, water basins, lakes and rivers, flood zones, agricultural lands, mine areas, liquefaction areas, and other areas which has problems according to ground characteristics also uh, showed uh, on the map. Uh, in this analysis, liquefaction areas, vulnerable geological formation, and peak ground acceleration will be Consider here uh, you can see natural limitations and geologically sensitive areas. Uh, because of the limited time, I'm not going into the uh, details. Uh, just I want to sh uh, show the maps to give a brief idea about the study and areas which are surrounded by major highways and major land uses. Uh, here you can see the north part of Istanbul, the green areas, wooden areas, and also water basin areas uh, and the agricultural areas. Transportation and geologically sensitive areas. Power and gas lines, the macro form of distribution of the macro form of Istanbul, public and land ownership, also important factor. And uh, we have uh, a great Istanbul municipality, Istanbul metropolitan municipality, and also some district municipalities. Here you can see the boundaries of uh, districts in Istanbul. And uh, we also uh, inspected the uh, plans uh, of Istanbul and we analyzed the proposal for new development. This is not our proposal. This is the Istanbul plans And uh, the second important analysis is the urban uh, texture risks. Uh, in, the scope is independent of the building safety, determination of risk in the differential formation of urban fabric comprising the plot, building coverage, and density. Access, it's very big city, and uh, we have different types of urban texture. Uh, access roads and car parking, ownership pattern, and other environmental properties. We define the problems. Uh, the first one is great disparities of risk between various types of urban pattern and unauthorized changes in the uh, course are observed. And the risk management, we uh, propose differentiation of urban texture zones in development plans and long-term physical policies for redevelopment, collective or singular buildings, differentiation property taxation, and obligatory insurance enforcement. 
here you can see the responsible bodies here. And the proposal formation of an intermunicipality working committee functioning very uh, with improved powers of municipalities in development, supervisions of construction, differential property taxation, municipal assessment in the determination of obligatory insurance, legal changes in municipalities, this is the number of law, development law, property taxation, uh, and the uh, uh, modification in the obligatory earthquake insurance draft law. We propose some changes with those plans in the, the laws, sorry. Uh, the configuration of urban physical elements, we uh, try to understand the buildings, road, car, car pattern, the uh, wide of roads and their relation to building heights. It's very important subject for the earthquake. Hierarchical and grid structure of road network, dimensions and division of urban blocks, building form and density, pedestrian movement, existence of car parks, ownership type characteristic, together with ground condition, determine different risk levels in the urban term. After the analyze, uh, urban texture types requires investigation and assessment of settlement pattern, having various characteristics, plant old and new settlements, mass housing areas, unplanned old and new squatter settlements have different pattern and characteristics. Plant existing areas, uh, I will show some uh, slides later. Uh, plant uh, urban patterns developed with attached buildings, plant urban patterns developed with detached buildings, mass housing settlement, uh, historic urban pattern, and also, as I told you, unplanned areas. Uh, we uh, define it low density, first generation, we call it squatter settlement, and high density, multi-story squatter settlement with the improvement and development plans. SNR and Bajlar Park. Within this framework, examples of urban patterns are investigated in terms of access, evacuation possibilities, effect of building collapse, population density, building plot characteristics, ground topography characteristics, the risks related to urban pattern characteristics depending on the macro form risk and use risk on settlement levels are determined groups of general characteristics, natural characteristics, road system characteristics, and building characteristics. Factors examined, the main risk data of the method is the type of urban pattern. The number of urban blocks, building, dwelling, and population and density in the pattern I directly use in the risk analysis. Dimensions of urban blocks, relation between forms and open spaces in urban blocks. This is the main urban pattern uh, analysis. And also urban block having attached or detached uh, forms and dimensions of pilot pilots open areas relations with roads have to be investigated total building ground area coefficient risks created by building functions are different for single and mixed use buildings some buildings have dwelling and commercial uh, facilities dwelling and service facilities dwelling and manufacture we try to define the all buildings physical condition. 
building and environmental quality and age of buildings are, are the other factors which can differentiate urban pattern risk. And also we in the urban pattern, urban texture, we try to define the natural characteristics uh, and road system characteristics. It's very important group of data in the analysis urban pattern risk is related to transportation planning of the city and the building characteristics uh, apart from the building resistance studies some uh, building characteristics uh, are investigated in uh, terms of urban pattern risk and the number of buildings types of buildings number of basement and stories, number of dwellings, so on. Other factors related to buildings, which can affect the urban pattern risk are use type, age, quality, ownership, and management system and population of the building. Uh, yes, uh, in this view, you can see uh, in one side different types of building. You can see detached, undetached, high-rise building, low-rise uh, building, uh, and this is another type. You can see different types. And uh, also uh, we use the map. This is an example of uh, plant and attached center of Istanbul, the place called Şişli. And this is another type, as I told, it's undetached building blocks. And plant mass housing, mass housing uh, area. It's called Atakö. It's built around 60s. It's also a view from Atakö. And another view. Mass housing, cooperative houses, and another one. It's also a cooperative house. As you see in Istanbul, different types of urban pattern. And here, the historic pattern, most of them very organic form. It's party district. And historic part of Istanbul, historic peninsula. Yes. Uh, and the third group uh, is about incompatible uses. Analysis of risk arising from adverse effect of incompatible urban uses in neighboring areas, building or within a building in the event of earthquake, difficulty of land use and building occupations control. This is the main problem. Change of use taking place without permission and the risk management, finer land use zoning and implicit designation of uses to be avoided in development plans, obligatory renewal of use permissions on a periodic basis, formation of municipal database, uses combining district administration, and the proposal formation of municipal working committees with necessary database for the surveillance of local users, committee public reporting, 
of problems every six month provisions in municipality. Here you can see the risks related to incompatible use. Yes. Risk of uh, productivity loss, investigation of seismic sensitivity of industrial enterprises, and risk of productivity losses in the industrial establishment in the case of earthquakes based on their size, location, building, and facilities, robustness, technology employment, materials process, and dependencies on infrastructures, access, input, output relations. The main problems, uh, enterprises are extremely vulnerable in terms of location and building quality. Resilience of the city is largely depend on the sustainability of the productive potential of the city in many direct and indirect way. Carrying out essential research on vulnerability classes of the industry, building a database and developing methods of mitigation, promoting local and sectoral cooperation. And the proposal is a safe industry committee to be established by the representatives of responsible bodies with information and inspection teams facilitating the special mitigation measures each enterprise has to take. The main idea is to take away those kind of uh, facilities in the settlement area. And risks in special area, for example, the seashore infill areas, dumps and downstream basins, riverbeds, and other areas subject to liquefaction and landslide are areas that require detailed and spatial analysis of risk. Problems, very clear, often superimposition of risk are observed in such areas, large population and Significant urban assets are at stake. Risk management, designation of spatial risk areas in the urban plans, retrofitting of lifelines, requirement of spatial geophysical investigation from private areas. Here you can see the place, spatial importance, uh, special vulnerable areas and we also uh, try to detail to prepare a detailed map about those areas to tsunami areas and we also try to find uh, open areas green car parks sports fields uh, are not sufficient size not in proximity to residential districts are not appropriate for the emergency requirement, then scarcities prevail and so the deficiency risk. Problems, of course, high density residential districts are deprived of open spaces, over fragmented nature of open space and green areas. And the risk management, increasing the ratio of open space by combining existing ones, reduction of densities in high risk areas, vacating land to create continuous strip of open space between major land uses. And proposal preparing a local open space implementation plan by special task groups of uh, municipality and municipality planners and representatives of local committees and NGOs view of macro open spaces policy.
And uh, another risk factor is the uh, hazardous uh, materials, urban uses that process, store, and distribute combustible, explosive, poisonous, and pollutant materials are sources of further, further risk. The location, environment, and routes of which should be separately investigated. Problems is very clear, unauthorized, and ignorant operation. Uh, ineffective uh, regulatory devices and standard and proposal uh, to make a protocol for comprehensive control over the province instituting permits and inspection system in line with European Union standards and procedural constraints, access to special data bank and transfer in management and information. Now this time, uh, we request you to please conclude your session because we have one more technical session to go on. Excuse me. Shall I stop here? Mom, do not stop. Please conclude your session uh, because, we because we have another session to go on. Please, please go on, but please conclude it uh, in two to five minutes. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Shall I stop? Yeah, actually, ma'am, we have another session lined up after you and we are running out okay, short of time. You. So if you can conclude in another two, three minutes, okay. if that's possible. Thank you. Yes, I also would like a historical and cultural heritage section. Uh, buildings of historical and cultural significance demand. Uh, yes, this is the uh, risk management of historical and cultural heritage. Uh, in 1919 uh, earthquake, you can see a mosque and uh, fallen down minaret and other risks, lifeline. This is the view after 1999 uh, earthquake, uh, the railway and the bridge. And uh, here the views and emergency facilities. We also work on emergency facilities, services, lifelines, and external risks. And uh, we uh, also prepare a contingency plan uh, and propose some projects. We didn't do the all project. We only uh, propose the project related to risks area. Emergence, open space, earthquake. Yes, this is the last uh, sentence. The earthquake master plan of Istanbul has provided an opportunity for an alternative to the existing methods of urban seismic risk management. The approach considers hazards of natural and human origin in combination within a framework of risk sectors and proposes lines of action to involve all factions of the urban uh, society. 
The purpose is to bring together and activate in every risk sector related components of public administration, business and industry, NGOs and local community representation in the long-term management of urban risks. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me and thank you for your passion. Thank you so much, Nuran Nam, for such a insightful session and uh, we got a huge knowledge in and around what's going in Istanbul and around Turkey regarding the, regarding the earthquake mitigation plan. Round of applause for Thank you. And we have another uh, audience that is online. We'll be taking offline and online audiences question and answers post uh, the second session. So I welcome Erika Isabel Parisi. Uh, 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 another technical session will be taken by her. She's graduated from Applied Science for Cultural Heritage at Sapienza University, Rome, and holds a PhD in Science for Conservation of Cultural Heritage from University of Florence, Italy. She has been carrying out research activities on multi-sensor digital surveys in the field of cultural heritage and environment at the GeoGo Lab, that is Geomatics for Environment and Conservation for Culture, Cultural Heritage. Um, in particular, she has experience in ground and aerial-based thermal Im imaging for heritage and land monitoring. Her research is also focused on the ap application of innovation educational approaches for teaching geomatics and on terraced landscapes Geospatial analysis. So, Erika, please come on board. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, ma'am, we can. Um, let me try to uh, share the screen and please let me know if you can see the full screen. Yes. Okay. Um, maybe I will switch off the camera just to save. Uh, uh, the I internet keep connection. Keep your hand on. Uh, okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this training program and for giving me the opportunity to talk about geomatics for documentation of at risk cultural heritage. Maybe we come from different research and professional fields, but our common interest is towards cultural heritage disaster risk reduction. Uh, I hope this presentation, uh, with this presentation to create awareness and give some different perspectives on this topic by showing the approach we have also uh, in Italy. Here, a summary of the issues I would like to go through in this lecture. I will start from the general idea of what modeling cultural heritage means. Then I will focus on how the survey changed in the restoration charters and how Italian rules consider it. Next, some critical aspects about the meaning of digital models nowadays. And finally, I will compare old and new technologies for data acquisition and present case studies. The only true evidence in architecture is the building itself. Therefore, a scientific approach for understanding a building must be based on systematic observation and measurement. The complexity of the relations among the elements of a building determined by their position in space can only be systematically approached by a model that takes into account the reciprocal spatial relations of the collected data. For this reason, well before the rigorous definition of analytic and descriptive geometry, 
the survey and its representation in two and three dimensions, both on paper and in physical models, has been the main instrument for studying architecture. Even if the survey can boast a long and solid tradition in the field of restoration, its role has only been truly appreciated in recent times. An examination of the restoration charters reveals that the reference survey are both superficial and fragmentary. The Athens Charter of 1931 recommends accurate records only for archaeological exca excavations and sites that will be reburied. The Venice Charter of uh, 1964 discusses uh, precise, precise uh, documentation in the form of analytical and critical reports illustrated with drawings and photographs without specifying the metrological value of the drawing. The Carta Italiana del Restauro uh, of 1972 finally indicates the content of the restoration project, affirming that it should be based on a complete graphic and photographic survey to be interpreted under a metrological point of view. We can find a document explicitly dedicated to the survey only at the end of the 20th century. The Carta del Rilievo Architettonico or Declaration sobre el Levantamiento Architettonico is not an ICOMOS charter, but it has been written by a group of Italian and Spanish experts trying to fill in this gap. This document recommends that the regulatory criteria for a survey should incorporate a project as well as the management of site operations and the final quality assessment and testing. It should additionally include a report indicating the implemented criteria, objectives and degree of precision so as to make a qualitative evaluation possible. The survey is further defined as an open system of knowledge that brings together all relevant data and whose creation involves multiple professional specializations. The study also alludes to the possibility of multimedia management and to the, uh, to the establishment of an information system that can be updated over time. This document finally emphasizes the structural survey among the teams from detailed study, pointing to the dual objective of illustrating the structural model in its overall configuration and documenting the geometric characteristics and the materials necessary for the engineer to carry out the required assessment and test. You surely know the ICOMOS principle for the analysis, conservation, and structural restoration of architectural heritage, the ICOMOS document specifically dedicated to the structural conservation of built heritage. The attached guidelines devote a section to structural surveys and highlight the importance of the direct observation of the building carried out by a multidisciplinary qualified team. It is worth noticing that the qualifying points of a structural or restoration survey are the same. Materials recognition, cracks detection, the survey of those geometric and structural irregularities that can be easily recognized using current survey techniques. Now, it may be interesting to examine how technical norms in Italy accommodate these opportunities offered by the techniques of geomatics, with particular regard to buildings of cultural interest. The Italian technical norms for construction contain a section on existing buildings. In this section, it is stated that the survey must refer to the total geometry both on the structure and of the constructive elements, including the relationships uh, with any other bordering structures. The survey 
should represent the modification made over time as inferred from a historical and critical analysis. The survey must identify the actual state of the structure. Any forms of damage must also be indicated, whether existing or repaired, paying particular attention to areas with cracks and damage mechanisms. About the built heritage in masonry, there are the guidelines for the assessment and reduction of seismic risk issued by the Ministry of Cultural Heritage on 2008. This document, highlighting the fragility of cultural heritage structures, reminds us that sometimes even to carry out a complete investigation may turn out to be too invasive. It is therefore necessary to fine tune different instruments and techniques for different levels of inquiry that can be sustained by the structures. The input data acquisition, it is defined as knowledge path, which steps are summarized in this slide. The norm reminds us that the existence of some general and unspecified instruments that allow for rapid surveying and the accurate restitution, even in the case of complex elements. Furthermore, the guidelines recognize as indispensable a monitoring program, which includes the necessary maintenance operations for the preservation and above all for attaining the nominal lifespan of the structure. In addition to the topographic and photogrammetric survey, laser scanning has been included. Personally, I think that point clouds are more appropriate for the survey than for the monitoring, and it's not anymore an innovative technique, but it is the first time that the norm focuses uh, on a careful assessment assessment of the chosen methodologies and not on the instruments in relation to their respective accuracy levels. From the information management point of view, the guidelines are contradictory. The software setup for the seismic risk assessment uses only two-dimensional data. On the other hand, there are many references to 3D data, both for the geometric and for the building, georeferencing, and crack positioning. It is also required the spatial localization of data that give an additional temporal dimension for historical periods, maintenance works, and so on. All, the mean, all that means uh, a spatial model related to the database in which all the information is collected. I'm sorry, can you see the slides? Because I see in the screen only the first slide. Can you please tell me if you are seeing the slide see going on? Sorry? You can see your slide. Moving. Ah, okay, now I see also in the, uh, okay, perfect. So I we're talking. Talk Okay, thank you. So we are talking about models, but are all models the same? Geomatics try to answer this question by providing models that have metric reliability and developing procedures to validate the achieved result. Searching for some communality between geomatics and structural engineers, we can say that we are both deeply interested in real world in stones, in bricks, in wood, in plaster, in real buildings, in objects existing on sites. And at the same time, we come used to look at all of this through a screen, to store these re realities on an hard drive, to share them in the cloud. So we recreate the reality into a virtual environment. Digitalization is one of our keywords, of course. It is mandatory or it is a possibility. How and does it improve our work 
and uh, indeed our lives? This is the question we, we ask ourselves. Digitalization requires a sampling process. The smaller the sampling, the higher the resolution. As the resolution is becoming higher and higher, it would seem that the difference between digital and real would become smaller and smaller. The consequences, uh, some analysis can be conducted directly on the 3D models rather than on the real object. When is this possible? How can we evaluate the suitability of a digital model for our purposes? If we consider only the sampling process, we should evaluate parameters such as visual effectiveness, data completeness, ease of transport and management, and last but not least, the cost, of course. But for technical purposes, 3D models need to be, first of all, reliable. This is the question offered by Geomatics with its methodology of measurement. In this way, we can also take into account the accuracy, the availability of georeferencing information, the state of conservation of the objects themselves. In brief, we want these models to assist in the decision-making process for specialists in restoration we must assure the high quality of the process of digitalization. So is it possible and how assess the quality of a 3D model? This is what we are talking about. We as geomatics and conservators don't need only a 3D digital model, but we need a 3D digital model with metric value. We usually disregard metric contribution. We are used to call them generically 3D models, those with metric values and those without this value, both of them. But the question is, how can we distinguish between the two? The file format doesn't offer the opportunity to store quality information. So metadata could be a solution, however, it needs to be recognized as part of the model, never forgetting and always consciously considered. We believe the error lies in the control of all stages of the process, the collection of metadata, the use of topographic networks, the, the attention physical indicators are all elements that allow us to keep the quality work under control. Actually, aspiration to metric accuracy is not a new issue. Typically, those most familiar with a monument were uh, surveyors armed with tape measures and plumb lines in ancient times, of course, who measured spaces and noted shapes and dimension in accordance with their knowledge of the history of architecture. Yet the badge of land surveyor or, or measurer have not generally been happily worn by architects or engineers who consider themselves to be in possession of a different and usually higher set of skills. In the past, Measurements were essentially limited to distances related to planes whose partial positioning was not simple to realize. The traditional survey was often unsatisfactory, all for measuring buildings with complex floor plans or spaces or height. For this reason, researcher uh, have for decades been experimenting with the use of technical instruments, which have already been tested for land surveying and cartographical production, such as topography and photogrammetry. Technological evolution and new tools make it quicker and less intensive to measure points. In the 1940s, 
to describe the curvature of the dome of the Florence Baptistery, it was analyzed just one profile measuring six points only that you can see in the picture. In the last decades, uh, with the advances in computer science and the transformation of digital platforms, we have seen a dramatic change in documentation systems, laser scanning, structure from motion, and digital photogrammetry have, for several years, now allowed us to survey complex geometries at lower cost, obtaining an identical result, a high-resolution sampling called a point cloud. As you can see in this video. This is the Gallery of Academia, uh, David. And as you can see, you have uh, collected information of all the space surrounding uh, uh, the uh, acquisition of data. So it is not just a, a single points like in the previous slide, all the environment. If we consider the geospatial market as applied to construction, attention is no longer directed toward acquisition in itself, but rather towards integration and automation of the various technologies. As you can see in this slide, we combine autonomous technologies with data processing automation, with portable scanners, as in this case, to acquire tunnels under a, mm, a monumental complex, uh, immersive data visual visualization, and all digital environment. Now I want to move to the last part of my uh, presentation in order to show you how the geomatics methodology and techniques have been applied in projects for uh, uh, risk evaluation and structural evaluation. Starting for this first category, architectural category, the domes. This has always been a challenging work because it involves structures which are difficult to measure. It is further difficult to measure their thickness because the extra dose is only visible in cramped crawl spaces. And if no direct openings are available, creating a topographic network to connect the internal and the external surfaces become a daunting task. The Church of San Vitale in Ravenna is one of the masterpieces of late Roman architecture. Its dome is built of clay pipes, closed at one hand, placed in concentric rings of decreasing diameters from the impost to the keystone. So this is the first case of study. Important studies were conducted on the dome in the 1990s. The time an irregular sewing point was measured with the total station on both the top and bottom surfaces. The reduced usability of the top to the topographic instrumentation has allowed to measure only the lower portion of the surface. These studies show that the surface was attributable to a spherical shape. So this was the first assumption. Recently, with the Polytechnic of Milan, we surveyed the dome using scanning systems and classical topographical and satellite systems for referencing the data. We wanted to measure the thickness of the shell and more generally, we would like to study the geometry of the dome for supporting historical research. The scanner's greater positioning flexibility allow, allowed data to be acquired on the entire surface of the dome as we saw before in the video of the David. The different results that the two surveys seem to achieve can only be justified by the impossibility of distributing in the first survey the observation over the entire dome, thus influencing the interpretative model that was derived from it. So we didn't have enough information in the first survey. 
at first glance and as described in the available documents, the shape of the dome can be traced back to a sphere. However, from the observation recorded, different models can be developed. A first model is of the radius are defined by means of best fitting operation. That is by applying the principle of least square to the deviation between the interpolating sphere and the measured points. The dome section and the facade overlapping. The, dis dis the display in transparency of the point cloud allowed to appreciate the morphological correspondence between the interior and the exterior structures. The sphere with radius equal to one of the drum in green describes only the first portion of the dome from the starting point up to an angle of uh, 21 degree. Above this point, the sphere that describes the surface of the intrados has a radius about uh, 17 meters and the lower center. In order to interpret the deviation from the ideal geometry, more in-depth analysis must be conducted, studying the variation of curvature and searching for a technological and constructive justification for the swelling identified in the key. A second model of the dome can be obtained by rotating a profile around an axis. The profile used is a polyline derived from the pattern of points and the axis of rotation was assumed as vertical. It is clear that a model generated in this way ensures a high congruence with the shell in the areas close to those where the profile was extracted but does not allow to document any deformation of the dome. The map of the deviation between the measured data and the model shows in fact two zones, diametrically opposite, opposite and placed at the maximum distances from the considered profile of systematically positive and negative deviations. A continuous mesh model, that is a surface model, is the one that best describes the continuity of the surface detected. But to highlight the irregularities, which are certainly of interest from the structural and the risk prevention point of view, an analysis of the state of conservation of the building is essential to use a more synthetic model or rather a comparison between the ideal model, more synthetic, the sphere in this case, and the measures. Statistical analysis tools are therefore used both to identify an ideal model, the best fitting of the sphere, for example, and to quantify the deviation of this model from the measurements made through maps that quantify the distances between the two sets of data, asking questions to which the history of the factory, the materials, the phenomena of degradation and instability can give an answer. So that, let's switch uh, to another case of study uh, always related to the don't. A broader case for the application of the techniques of geomatics for the study of domes is this uh, Basilica of the Madonna dell'Umiltà in Pistoia. The dome was built by Giorgio Vasari in the mid 16th century. The architect consolidated and inserted a lot of tie rods in the corners of the pre existing structure which was considered inadequate for supporting a large double calotte dome, as in this case. Nonetheless, a lot of cracks were already visible after only a few years, leading Vasari himself to add other tie rods, both on the exteriors and the interior. 
The four additional uh, tie roads uh, and the works of reinforcement carried out by Bartolomeo Mannati, which is another architect, were the first of a long series of interventions, which were, however, unable to prevent further damage. Recent methodological developments in the analyzing masonry structures has led to fresh interest in studying the basilica with the aid of geomatics technology since 2008. A few examples of the bidimensional outputs extracted from the 3D model, you can see the option all coming from the 3D model you can see on the right side of the slide. The survey is not only the basis on which to create structural models, but especially in such sophisticated and complex cases, represents the only tool which allow correlation of the overall geometry, the construction techniques, the characterization of the texture of the materials, the position of the tie rods, the cracks detection and mapping. Combining this data with historical and archival information enable researchers to gain access to the reasoning behind the initial project and to the modification carried out over the series. Here, uh, the detail of the cracks in the vestibule, for example, you can see them in uh, yellow and white. The greatest challenge in performing the survey extended to the entire basilica regarded the difficulty in carrying out topographical measurements and laser scans, both in the tight crawl space between the two domes and in serving the exteriors, given that the building is quite high and located in a network of narrow roads. The need to conduct a detailed survey of small elements, such as all the decorative features and the position of the craft, in spite of this limitation, was very uh, difficult. This survey allowed the researcher to more clearly understand the morphology of the work, in particular of elements which are not directly visible. Vasari himself, uh, when the first cracks appeared, period modified the system of vertical connections and the crawl space structure of the dome, adding eight ribs in the crawl space to sustain the weight of the lantern. So the survey highlighted and made it possible to quantify the number of ribs, their correct placing, form and dimension. Then also the exact placing and dimension of the internal and external tie roads, the actual thickness of the two calots, the building materials and technique, the consolidation of the intervention, the internal connection, both horizontal and vertical. It allowed also to identify the cracks present on both calots, highlighting the most damaged awnings, and the links among the geometry, structure, and deformation shown over time. Let's move to another uh, case study, uh, again concerning the domes. This is the Florence Baptistry. It is one of the most important cases in the history of architecture. Even in the past, researchers used progressively more advanced technologies to more exactly determine its geometry and to clarify doubts about its origin. In the first on-site survey phase, a topographic control network that you can see on the left was defined, calculated and adjusted in a local reference system. To align the scans, around 100 control points were measured some to calculate alignments and others to check and validate the result. 241 scans were made in total. The point model obtained after aligning the scans is made up of more than 14 billion points. 
vector drawings and auto images were derived from this with the necessary level of detail for correct and effective reproduction on paper at a 1 to 50 scale. From a structural point of view, the new survey enabled, enabled investigators to more closely study the construction technique of the buttresses that uh, transfer the weight of the roof to the dome and the texture of the brick masonry of the dome exodus, which confirmed that Roman bricks were reused. Deformations in the masonry were also studied. A comparison of the walls of the octagonal hall with the vertical reference planes revealed a slight bulge in right below the area without the marble cladding, where it was found an iron tie rod placed in 1514. In addition, the walls are slightly out of plumb toward the exterior. Thought this is not evident to the naked eye because of the ornate decoration of the facade. The current accurate survey compared to the presumed original geometry obtained through a methodological analysis, the identification of the original design allowed to estimate the global entity of the deformation under a geometrical point of view as confirmed of the results of statical analysis. The survey also allowed the researcher to tune the numerical model to the available experimental results and to interpret the detected cracking pattern. The 3D model has been transformed into a finite element model for structural evaluation and risk assessment and prevention. Let's move now to another uh, category of case of study, which are the towers. In every culture, a significant portion of cultural heritage buildings consist of slender structures, towers, belfries, minarets, and so on. So an accurate survey of their geometry is particularly difficult, even with the techniques of geomatics. Indeed, they usually contain walls of notable thickness, few For all these reasons, it is difficult the topographic network that links interior and exterior. In addition, if it is not possible to take measurements at height, it is difficult to survey the top of the structure with the same resolution as at the top, given that resolution is inversely proportional to the range distance. Most structure of this type show an inclination that is more or less apparent. This is the Torre del Mangio in Siena, which has a square base of roughly seven meters on each side, and it is 88 meters tall. Is this, this is one of the highest medieval tower in Italy. Two sides bordered on other structure, such that it is possible that is possible to collect data only from the positions that are quite close and foreshortened. On the other hand, the sites facing the Piazza del Campo, the square, are more visible. Yet at the time of the survey, the available instruments that were able to take readings at such distance produced results of inferior resolution. To determine the degree of inclination, 10 horizontal sections where isolated buildings begins and 61 meters below the crown work and the displacement of their centers was measured. In this case, the inclination turned out to be meaningless, equal to roughly 80 centimeters. Beginning with the point model, a numerical finite element model was constructed with the help of structural engineering 
information from the geometric survey cross-referenced with data from a radar survey was used to reproduce the dynamic behavior of the tower and to evaluate the physical evidence of the experimental result. So this is a simulation. More significant inclinations were investigated during studies on other towers of the same city, which is uh, another city, which is San Gimignano, in the RISEM project, which stands for Seismic Risk of Monumental Buildings, led by Professor Bartoli, a colleague of our department. To measure the inclination, the displacement of the center of gravity of tower sections at various levels was analyzed as were the deviation with the vertical reference planes. In case, the deviation were quite significant, but unfortunately it was not possible to study their evolution because this was the first survey done in this way. So we didn't have any other data to compare them. Another significant case of study um, which uses geomatics in support of structural investigation of a slender building is the oblique minaret in Aksar, Aksaray, sorry, <laughs> in Turkey. The building is 30 meters tall and inclined significantly. Beginning with the geometric model acquired by laser scans, in this case, again, deviation analysis was performed which allowed investigators to accurately identify the direction uh, of and changes in the inclination. Again, the finite element models generation from point cloud data was investigated with different upgrading a mesh model and converting it to solid model resulted the fastest, fastest and most accurate method being able to preserve accurately the original geometry. The usefulness of an accurate model was apparent during the evaluation of the seismic vulnerability of a tilted minaret through the pushover approach. Let's move now to other structures as case of study, so mixed uh, uh, built uh, heritage. Um, Hello, Audible? Yes. Uh, Ma'am, I'm sorry, but we are running out of our scheduled time. I request you to please conclude your session in five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Thank you. So, uh, the towers along the walls, this is the same city of the towers, uh, cannot be considered among slender structures as the, they rather are extremely massive structures and they have very thick walls made of concrete um covered by stone or cylindrical in shape with a sharp base. Laser scanning was used again to survey the overall geometry, but outside here we can see a detail of the exterior wall acquired by laser scanning. And also inside, this is a detail of the narrow space inside the tower. Photogrammetry was also employed to study the external walls and the cracks at a very high resolution, and it's shown in the details of brick cladding. The survey geometry was compared to the surface, so to a irregularity, which could provide possible clues for anomalies in the original construction or later damages. So this is another example of the point cloud obtained from the laser scanner survey uh, that was used to reconstruct the geometric shape of the tower and of the surrounding area as a solid model at first and then as a 3D solid mesh for structural analysis. This is a, a completely different case of study. This is the pulpit of Sant'Andrea by Giovanni Pisano in Pistoia. This uh, video is a, the 3D model of the pulpit and it is in danger and required an intensive investigation campaign to verify its stability. One of the problems stems from the columns, each inclined in different direction. So for structural investigation, it is important to correctly determine the axis of the columns, but they are made of a material that makes it difficult to detect the outer surface. 
So a set of sections were extracted from the point cloud. Then the best fit circumferences were first detected. And finally, the line passing through the center of the circumferences, as you can see here. And I will conclude finally with uh, this uh, case of study, which is the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence, again, where the David is stored. Uh, they required um, a survey of the entire building for seismic evaluation and assessment. And these are some of the uh, results from the topographic networks, the point cloud, uh, the relationship to the bordering buildings chosen as the resolution. And you can see some 2D outputs that were extracted and uh, some cracks uh, detected on the ceilings. And also this room had uh, several and uh, important structural problems. So we provide the data to the structural engineer to uh, assess where to intervene. And that's all. So I hope I uh, am in uh, time and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Erika Parisi for your insightful session on modeling and documentation of the heritage buildings. So uh, now I ask our audiences online and offline both if they have any questions regarding both the sessions, both technical sessions to Erika ma'am or Nuran ma'am. Anyone? Okay, so we have two questions. Uh, first is uh, Yashraj Jain. Um, uh, sorry, but uh, I don't know who is uh, Yashraj. Who, uh, who are you asking to? How can we incorporate LIDAR 3D GIS in disaster management for cultural heritage structures? Uh, yes, so uh, as I showed in the um, slides, uh, it is a multi-source um, data coming from different instruments, different techniques. So what we want to create is not only data, but information. Information that are useful for uh, who is in charge to um, uh, decision making. So different uh, professional, different uh, responsibilities. And uh, we just provi provide the data and uh, we can help in the interpretation. But then uh, our role stops and maybe uh, it's more um, what Nuran professor uh, does because we provide the data to who is then in charge to uh, decide how to uh, manage the risk and mitigate the risk. So um, we are focused mainly on data acquisition, data processing and data analysis and provide as reliable data as possible with metric accuracy and to ease uh, the role of the decision maker. So this is our role and the role of geomatics. I don't know if I answered the question. I think this uh, answers the question to, to uh, Yashraj. Now, Manu, uh, my question is that how risk, uh, how risk management is done in case of heritage building which have less of architectural base in their formation? 
how to make them more resistant to damage by natural disasters. Nura, Nura ma'am, should I repeat the question? No, I cannot catch it. How is risk management is done in case of heritage buildings which have less of architectural base in their formation? How to make them more resistant to damage by natural disasters? Actually, uh, we uh, define the project, uh, project packages, and we didn't do uh, during the preparation of master plan. After the master plan, uh, a group uh, of restorators and uh, historians uh, inspected the historic buildings and uh, they, uh, not the whole Istanbul, uh, of course, they started to work uh, on uh, World Heritage List uh, of the area uh, we didn't uh, do during the uh, preparation of master plan as I understand correctly the question any questions from the offline audience Anybody would like to question anything? So if we do not have any questions from the participants or if they have, they can also register them for the next two days as we are already out of time. But uh, I really thank uh, Professor Nuran Zarin and uh, Dr. Erika Parisi from uh, Turkey and Italy to for having this time for us and from, from the busy, busy schedule and providing us with the global perspective of the cultural heritage, how we can conserve them, how the global practices are going on. So we can incorporate it in our indigenous way and we can, few of them we can take as it is and apply it for our cultural heritage. So from an IGM and also from LJ University, I wholeheartedly thank you, both of you, for your time and uh, yeah, presentations. Welcome. Thank you. Now, ma'am, can you please uh, move forward with the for with the formal vote of thanks and further closing proceedings? Yes, sure. So this concludes our first session on cultural heritage disaster risk management reduction. I'm sorry, and uh, I would like to thanks Dr. Professor Anjana Vyas, the director of this program, this training program, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Dinesh Avasti, Honorable Vice Chancellor of LJKU, uh, Professor Santosh Kumar, Head, NIDM, Mr. Taj Hassan, IPS Executive Director, NIDM. Unfortunately, both of them couldn't come here, uh, come for the session. Uh, Dr. Nuran Zen uh, Gulrusar, Professor Istanbul, Turkey, Dr. Erika I. Parisi, Univers University of Florence, Italy, and uh, Mr. Ali Heather and Vivek Sharma for your support and coordination. Thank you so much. So this concludes our first session uh, on this training program. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And you, ma thank you again, Professor Nolan and uh, Dr. Erika. We hope I to see you again you. in our next sessions. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for inviting me. <laughs> our pleasure, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, just a second, Bye. Uh, thank you, Nolan. Thank you, Erika and Manjana here. You're welcome. It's You're nice, welcome. nice of you that you have come on the wee hours. Very less time given to you, but uh, you have taken my words and came here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Both of you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.